Hello, and welcome to episode 42 of Pulp Today with my lovely guest. I'm not sure what side the app will put her on. Oh, oh. Susie Kane. Hi. You have enjoyed on films and television, uh, most recently for me in Lodge 49. What have you been uh, doing since Lodge Over there, yeah. That will probably be the last one, Lodge 49. What yeah. Have you been, what have you worked on since then? Anything? Oh, so much in the last year. Well, yes, so 2020, was, 2020 was a tough one. Here's my question. I have one question about Lodge 49. Yeah. I don't know why, but I became obsessed with the fact uh, your character seemed to me like she was a dark mirror of Olivia Newton-John in Xanadu. In Xanadu? The white, the white costume. Amazing. And the fact that she is a muse. She is maybe a muse. But maybe. she's the muse of destruction. Uh, I, I <laughs> ah. love that someone put together a supercut of you saying horrible, horrible things in French. Is that was that was probably one of the proudest moments of my life. <laughs> it was AMC who did it. Yeah, uh, it was a trailer, I'm... and it's just me. And they decided to finally subtitle her. Um, yeah. So people who don't know Lodge Forty Nine or the second series, I pop up as Paul Giamatti's muse, and I'm speaking French. Yes. And yeah. it's not subtitled, and yes. so you don't know what I'm saying. And then eventually, yeah. if you go in either chat rooms. Uh, and ignore people talking about my accent uh, or go <laughs> look at the AMC advert. Yeah. Uh, it explains that she's saying things like your testicles will burn yeah. in the blue fire and yeah. my I mean, soul I, is made of maggots. I don't, I don't know any French, but occasionally a proper noun would leap out at me. <laughs> a noun would leap out at me or a verb and I'd go, that sounds dark, what she's saying. <laughs> A lot of going on there. Do you speak? Yeah. Do you speak French? Did you before? Well, the uh, Jim asked me because I spent a lot of time in France. My parents lived in France, and he knew I spoke French. I mean, I, my he let me uh, come up with sort of a backstory for her, and he didn't ask what it was. <laughs> he said, "Whatever <laughs> it is, that's it." So I've never said what, but I have. I have the whole reason why she says it. The whole reason why it's in French. She's not necessarily French, that's all, that's right. all I'll say. Um, but I, I'm not, I can never really say because there's always that little hope that it might come back. You oh, know, absolutely. It might do I would love for it to come movie, back. You know, you know, Wyatt Russell, who's yeah. now doing the Falcon and Winter Soldier and is Captain America, which is yeah. not that close to Dud as a character. No. But I mean, he was talking about Lodge too and everybody involved in it, I think just loves it. And we would love some, way for it to come back yeah. so you know, you know i can't remember we, we talked to my wife worked on it uh on i know the, doing costumes a little bit down in long beach down in long beach yeah that's really cool so, that was so yeah cool. no i i love the show i uh i kind of feel like the first promos they did oversold the magical realism a little bit and that may have hurt the audience a little bit but i uh and i love the there's a way of being a pastiche of something else influenced, inspired by another, by something else that's really great. And there's a way that's shitty. And the way that that show is informed by Thomas Pinchon and the crying of Lot 49 and all that is great. <laughs> you know, that it's, yeah. that it, it, it's adopting the tone and it's got the 49 there in the title. To me, it's, there's something about uh, when you're when you're when you're lifting, when you're being inspired by another artist, and you deny that, that's kind of gross. When you don't deny it, when instead you go, I'm going to put the the number forty nine in my title, so that oh, the yeah. people watching this go, yeah. this is a lot like a Thomas Pinchon thing. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> yeah. You know, he he's yeah. not trying to he's not trying to fool you. No, no, no. It's one of my favorite trivia things in you know star wars is ba the original star wars is based on plot wise it's based on kurosawa's hidden fortress and i don't know that a lot of people notice that the guy that darth vader strangles on the death star is in the middle of saying the phrase hidden fortress when he gets strangled 
And it's almost like oh, Lucas is really? going, wow. but, but, but don't say Hidden Fortress in this movie. <laughs> like we're not saying Hidden Fortress here because that gives away That's the joke. Amazing. But That's yeah, very cool. I've always appreciated that. I'm going to tell people that and then I'll look like a proper <laughs> Star Wars You should. It's very, very, it's very, very clever stuff. Yes. Wow. Because it's episode 42, Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Guide. I worked in a used bookstore when I was a teenager. So almost every paperback I own says, after you've read it, swap it for credit. The book swap, Milltown, New Jersey in it because this is where I got my books from. I also have a restaurant at the end of the universe. I couldn't find, yeah. which again, Life the universe. nice. Look at that. The book swap. I don't know that I owned the other, all five parts of the trilogy, which is one of my favorite Douglas Adams joke, the, the increasingly inaccurate uh, <laughs> trilogy, yeah. five books in it, <clears throat> which also seems like a joke on all of those guys like uh, Isaac Asimov with Foundation and Frank Herbert with Dune, who did trilogies that were definitely called trilogies. And then they're like, here's the fourth one. Yeah. <laughs> the fifth one. <laughs> Tolkien's the only one who went, no, it's a, it's, there are three of them. I'm, just, I'm not doing a fourth that happened. You, know. you need a bit more structure. Yeah. Yeah. He had a little more respect for the idea of a trilogy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, we were talking before I started recording about listening. I listened to the radio show in the 70s and cassette taped it and loved it. And you discovered it on television in the 80s. Yeah, and my, when we were growing up, the, the radio series had sort of come and gone. And when you're a very little kid, uh, you know, it's telly. It's all about telly. And my dad was one of the first people to start taping everything. Uh, from the 70s on VHS and so we had walls of VHSs with different things on which nice. meant as a kid you could just watch it again and again so when we'd watch something and it was a bit too young or I didn't know what was going on doesn't matter two years later you're going to be watching this again and then two years later you'll watch it again and so Hitchhikers the TV series was I mean the if you put on any scene now I can probably talk along we just we watched it again and again and yeah. again it was it it's like the Pythons contemporaries and colleagues of Douglas Adams. Yeah. It's part of British DNA. There's so much about the, not so much the TV show, the writing of it and the mm. ideas of it and the, the real ennui and, and existential angst. I mean, it's very dark. It's, it's something that I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think uh, some of the best comedy would work as drama if you if it just had a slightly different inflection and i think that the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy i mean D adams was coming off of being a writer on doctor who yeah and the the line of demarcation between doctor who being drama and the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy being comedy is a very thin line i mean the i mean that's um, sort of simultaneous i think yeah. he used the same script to get yeah. onto doctor who yeah and the, you know, felt and, and at least you know Tom Baker's Doctor Who, which was the Doctor Who of my childhood, is uh, my favorite, my those favorite. are very funny. That's so funny. He's very so he's funny. very funny in the part. That sort of he walks you through the terrible sets and the ridiculous costumes by being his <laughs> his humor makes you go, okay, I'm going to ignore how horrible that latex mask. <laughs> Concentrate on how charming Tom Baker. Uh, he, isn't he just the best? I mean, he, yeah. he's probably most of our favorite doctors, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been some brilliant ones and the recent ones are fabulous too, but I mean, yeah. Tom Baker is. But Tom, it's it's one of those things where it's hard to, and I like the first three guys fine. They're fine, you know, but Baker takes it, the eccentricity. And I think it's partially because maybe he was the youngest guy doing it yet at that point. It wasn't he's dangerous and he was, he yeah. is. He's a big, larger than life, head in a stick, funny, you yeah. know, mouth chap. And, and he's a real actor's actor and beloved of actors in Britain. Yeah. You know, everything, everybody who's worked with him has a, an anecdote about him, mm. you know. You know, my dad was in the final John Pertwee oh, series, yeah. a storyline before it turned into 
Tom Baker. So dad was Simple Tommy in Planet of the Spiders. I call him Simple Tommy. I don't know if he's known as Simple Tommy, but he, he was Simple Tommy, uh, who a stone made him suddenly super intelligent. So Doctor Who fans on Twitter probably contact me more about dad in Doctor Who than about either me or anything else that my dad has ever done. <laughs> There's a planet of the spiders. That is funny. But yeah, the, the, the science fiction writing in all the Douglas Adams stuff is very good. The concepts are very good. Oh, huge. I mean, the imagination and, yeah. and but also to, to give yourself the, the obstacle course of having a, a Hitchhiker's Guide book to occasionally have to quote from. So you've got to have a whole new bit of information that's made up but uh that's but it's a this. it's such a great format to hang a science Brilliant. fiction series on that you can constantly break in like imagine if you were watching star trek and every 10 minutes stephen fry or whoever did the voice original is like a phaser is a very dangerous thing yeah, <laughs> like, yes. when you point it at a klingon you know like it to to be able to just yeah. like to do these digressions off into, we're going to tell you the whole story of this thing, and then we're going to come back to our main narrative. Why you talk about it, and as a child, and I was very little when I started watching it, and it is, there's a lot of threatening and quite scary concepts oh, sure. in it, you know, and the, the, the sort of futileness of yeah. people pleading to protect various planets and, and failing. But the book was, I can remember the feeling of the book, with, I think Peter Jones did the voice, lovely, friendly, mm -hmm. sort of avuncular tone was your your sort of safe haven yeah. throughout the series. It's suddenly yeah. you're having, you know, the Don't Panic book uh, going. It's that, it's, oh. <laughs> very, it's that very BBC announcer voice. Yes. Uh, I spent three months exactly. in London when I was a kid, so I had a little taste of that and watched a certain oh. amount of British TV when I was a kid. And I got used to that. You know, this is the BBC Home Service. That voice from well, it's the goons. It's the from goons. That it's voice from the goons is very similar yeah. to, and I love the way the goons drag uh, their announcer in every once in a while. Wallace, <laughs> yeah, played, was that his name? Am I remembering that is right? Is it Wallace Greenslade? Oh God, I should know. I think it was I, I Wallace Greenslade. But uh, but yeah, all of that stuff was a huge influence on me, and and uh, I discovered the radio show first then went out and bought the paperbacks and this is what is this edition 79 so i'm 14. yeah this is this is a really uh, classy and expensive australian version from pan <laughs> publishing <Nice. laughs> my husband's set nice He's got of it, all of them but yeah i mean it's but but I did not know, I presumed as a kid that it was a TV show based on a book. I did not realize it was a TV show based on a book that was based on a radio series. And I, don't, I can't think of anything at the time other than the serials of, you know, the sort of sure. cheesy serial books. That, but it, it's such a literary, you know, great genius work. Yeah, no, not a lot of yeah. people can Writings. write radio plays and... TV scripts and novels and have them all be equally kind of great. You know, yeah. uh, I'm a big fan of the writing in the radio show and I kind of like the way the the book and then the TV show, you know, they he doesn't have the space to work with that he does on radio. He knows there are things that can't be filmed yeah. on a BBC production, on a BBC budget, on a, yeah. sub, on a sub Doctor Who budget, you know, it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> that easy to do two-headed people but they tried they did their best um but yeah, I love uh if you would for me read the yeah. the opening uh introduction intro I put it up on my computer so that I don't have to peer you it's all, right. all about respecting the eye line such a pro far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 92 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape ascended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. This planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much all of the time. 
many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of these were largely concerned with the movements of small green pieces of paper, which is odd because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. And so the problem remained. Lots of the people were mean, and most of them were miserable, even the ones with digital watches. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they'd all made a big mistake in coming down from the trees in the first place. And some suggested that even the trees had been a bad move and that no one should ever have left the oceans. And then one Thursday, nearly 2000 years after one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change, a girl sitting on her own in a small cafe in Rickmansworth suddenly realized what it was that had been going wrong all this time. And she finally knew how the world could be made a good and happy place. This time it was right. It would work. And no one would have to get nailed to anything. Sadly, however, before she could get to a phone to tell anyone about it, a terrible, stupid catastrophe occurred and the idea was lost forever. This is not her story. But it is the story of that terrible, stupid catastrophe and some of its consequences. It is also the story of a book, a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, not an Earth book, never published on Earth, and until the terrible catastrophe occurred, never seen or even heard of by any Earth man. Nevertheless, a wholly remarkable book. In fact, it was probably the most remarkable book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor, of which no Earth man had ever heard either. Not only is it a wholly remarkable book, it is also a highly successful one, more popular than the celestial home care omnibus, better selling than 50 more things to do in zero gravity, and more controversial than Oolong Colifid's trilogy of philosophical blockbusters, Where God Went Wrong, Some More of God's Greatest Mistakes, and Who Is This God Person Anyway? In many of the more relaxed civilizations on the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, the Hitchhiker's Guide has already supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. For though it has many omissions and contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important respects. First, it is slightly cheaper. And secondly, it has the words, don't panic, inscribed in large, friendly letters on its cover. But the story of this terrible, stupid Thursday, the story of its extraordinary consequences, and the story of how these consequences are inextricably intertwined with this remarkable book, begins very simply. It begins with a house. That is fantastic. That was really great. The, uh, one of the things I was thinking about when we were talking, thinking about talking about this book is that there were certain things Science fiction fandom was such a small insular community uh, back in the day. And there were certain things that marked you as a true fan. And one of them was being aware of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And <laughs> science fiction fandom has always been full of secret handshakes and, uh, you know, of, uh, of coded language, like using the word grok. In Robert Heinlein's Stranger in the Strange Land, he creates the word grok which means I understand in a particularly complete way. And the stuff from Hitchhiker's Guide, the number 42, which we'll get mm -hmm. to in a second. Uh, at a convention last year, I bought, there's a whole thing in Hitchhiker's Guide about how important it is to carry a towel with you yes. uh, as you hitchhike through the galaxy. I actually got a don't You panic. got one! I got a don't wow. panic towel. Uh, hand towel, which hangs proudly in my bathroom. Um, That's very cool. And uh, again, we, we I, I, I glossed over it, but one of the great science fiction ideas in this book is that a, a civilization creates the greatest computer ever known called Deep Thought, which is a very 1970s joke about a porn movie uh, called Deep Throat. And of course, Watergate, there's a lot of levels to that joke. Yes. Um, is created to come up with the answer to life, the universe, and any, everything. And the answer it comes up with is, I love that it, before it gives the answer, it says, you're not going to like it. Very <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is 42. And then of course it goes, well, the thing is you didn't say what the 
question was. And the question is definitely not what's seven times six. Yeah. So, um, and the idea that the earth is a supercomputer built to solve the mystery of life, the universe in it, that's as beautiful an idea as anyone has ever come up with in a, sci in a straight science fiction novel. The idea that humanity is a, literally a computer program trying to solve the mystery of existence. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, but the number 42 is the answer. And that's why for the 42nd episode, <clears throat> I wanted to do this. Uh, and usually I let guests choose their own book, but I was like, I don't want to read. <clears throat> I'm not English and I don't want to, uh, I flatter myself that my accents are pretty good, but I don't want to impose that on an audience. So I thought, I bet Susie Kane likes this stuff and I bet she would read it. And of course, luckily enough, I was correct. And this was also a part of your life. Oh, yeah. But I, I think it is. It's part of British DNA as well. You know, he was that whole era of genius writers. He wrote for the Pythons. It's no sort of surprise. But, but it, that stuff is is all part of the British psyche, certainly the English psyche. And mm -hmm. 42 yeah. is a number. It's 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 as common to us as the Queen, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, come on, mom. Uh, it, you know, and forty-two. Everybody, if you hit forty-two, anybody mentions it, it you'll make no, a remark. Think, I mean, I don't know if it's, is it the same in America? Is it as big? It's in pretty. Not? If I remember correctly, like uh, Fox Mulder, David Duchovny's character on the X Files, I'm pretty sure he lives in apartment number forty-two in oh. his apartment building. Like that's one of the. That's the kind of thing. Like when you're stuck yeah. for a number as a science fiction writer, you just use 42 because it's the funny, you know, cool. it's, it's, it, it, that's what I sort of mean about it being the, the secret language. And, you know, there's a way in which all of this stuff kind of meshes together in a community. And one of those ways, when I reread that passage a couple of days ago, the reference to the Encyclopedia Galactica jumped out at yeah. me. That's, yeah. that's from Isaac Asimov's foundation series. Like that's, he didn't make that up. That's the Encyclopedia Britannica is a very key part of the foundation series. They're putting together this encyclopedia that's going to, you know, tell the history of the, of the galaxy. Well, Encyclopedia Britannica is a thing. Of course, of course. Uh, as, as you know, but I didn't know, I didn't know the Asimov. Yeah, I, hey. like I said, there's no way in hell Doug Adams didn't know though. You know what I mean? Like he no. shows, oh, no. shows no, that, I mean, that, that's a little bit of a, uh, and if and I looked it up, and uh, he's not the only one. Heinlein refers to the Encyclopedia Galactica like it's just one of those funny things that people, you yeah. know, there are tropes that come into science fiction, and and everybody uses them. And you know, sometimes you forget where they came from, sometimes you don't. But uh, that's what I mean it's about flexing that. your muscles a bit these days, isn't it? You want to show how much you know. You, oh, you that, know, you that is absolutely it. in a reference. You absolutely want to say, "Look, I I used a forty-two in something. I'm I'm one of you." Yes, and I'm. Yeah, and it's also it's a way of, you know, we all like to uh, honor the people who influenced us, and Doug Adams is a huge influence on so many writers. Uh, and Doug, I'd say that Douglas Adams is one of those writers that even people who've never read any Douglas Adams have been influenced by him because too many writers influenced by Douglas Adams have, it's like Spike Milligan. We were talking about yeah. Spike before we went on. If you know nothing about The Gone Show, you've never seen Spike Milligan's face, you've never heard his voice, his, in, you've, you've, his influence is in your life. Like if you've watched a Monty Python You've yeah. heard an echo of Spike Milligan. Oh, I mean, the Pythons wouldn't be the Pythons without Spike. And if you watch Spike Milligan's first comedy series, and I would urge you, if you haven't, to see it, Q, it's called, just the letter Q. Oh, okay. um, and the pilot is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It's black and white. Mm -hmm. It predates Pythons. But you see that the Pythons, and I think they admit it, saw yeah. what Spike was doing, worship Spike because of the younger generation than the goons and love sure. the goons of course it's wacky it's surreal um but just sort of lifted it <laughs> directly yeah. from spike yeah. milligan and yeah. they're both doing the similar 
comedy, no, but even, it's the rhythm of that kind of comedy yeah. as well. And I would say that Spike's influence is in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a very specific, oh, oh, complete. Yeah, I mean they very these guys specific all form the same of general. humor. Uh, yeah. As and irreverent, very irreverent of authoritative concepts. Yeah. I mean, in that, just in that passage, he's already taken the piss out of, so I don't know if we do this, it's a sweary show. Um, oh, no, you can swear, it's fine. But okay. Yeah, and out of, out of God, I mean, he's, he's taking the mickey out of someone, you know, yeah. doing a critique of <laughs> oh, God's Well, and it's, and it's also that so very English stiff upper lip in the face you know he he destroys the earth in the first couple of chapters in this book yeah and you know there's a great sequence of uh uh it's actually i think it's the inside front cover text on mine uh this is arthur dent england no longer existed he'd got that somehow he got it he tried again america he thought has gone he couldn't grasp it he decided to start smaller new york is gone no reaction. He'd never seriously believed it existed anyway. The dollar, he thought, has sunk forever. Slight tremor there. Every <laughs> Bogart movie has been wiped, he said to himself, and that gave him a nasty knock. McDonald's, he thought. There is no longer any such thing as a McDonald's hamburger. He passed out. <laughs> when he came round a second later, he found he was sobbing for his mother. Over McDonald's yeah. hamburgers. But it's totally. just like, it's funny to boil. And it's the year we've just been through. I mean, it, it's, it is weird looking at different passages and, and, and just little sections that I always loved. I always loved the hairdressers and middle management mm -hmm. being kicked off a planet. Yeah. And, I and call it again, history. how things, uh, for the people who aren't familiar with it, one of the plots, one of the later plots in this thing is that they encounter three space arcs that are heading for a new, a new resettle a new planet. I may get some of this wrong. Uh, arcs, arc one is like soldiers and diplomats and scientists. Arc two is artists and painters and filmmakers and radio personalities. And arc three is- Middle management, HR, uh, sales managers, hairdressers. Yeah. And they they end up on arc three our heroes end up on arc three which they it's such a goon show joke they discover not only is it going to tr crash land it's supposed to crash land <laughs> like yeah. the, the, the other the other two ships go back to the planet they came from and have a lovely time that's, yeah, that's right it, while it driving, while driving mid i remember one of the jobs was telephone sanitizer that always crashed uh, yeah, yeah yeah you know why yeah, i remember amazing. as ridiculous as this sounds at the a, not long after I had read these books, I got a job as a telemarketer. And the first thing I had to do when I started my shift was take an alcohol prep oh. and rub it over my phone because who knows who the last guy was. And oh. as a, every time I was doing that, I would think I am a telephone sanitizer. <laughs> I'm going to be kicked off the planet. And uh, I still snob that I am. I, I will still refer to useless people as their their third arc They're, <laughs> those are those are some third arc people they're on the arc that crash lands that doesn't but, get but, what's, but it's also so brilliant about it is they crash land on the i don't know spoilers yeah. um planet they crash land on is prehistoric 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 earth and earth in other words we are descended from the middle the most worthless the hairdressers people. Yeah. the word that yeah and yeah. then that's, which also, which also that's probably awesome. slows down the working of the great computer because we weren't supposed to be here uh, messing up the quest. Supposed to be a computer, I know. But oh, uh, but yeah, it's 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 all it's all great stuff. And yeah, the I, it reminds me of one of my favorite Spike Milligan stories. I know we're talking about Spike almost as much as Doug Adams, but in one of his novels, he talks about how he, or one of his memoirs, he talks about how he met. Uh, the main act, the, the guy who always played uh, Seagoon, Nitty Seagoon. I'm spacing on the actor's name. Oh, right. Nitty, Nitty. Uh, uh, Welsh actor. He means Seacom. Uh, Seacom. Yeah. Harry Seacom. Harry Seacom. And what uh, my brain went. My favorite thing, one of my favorite things in that book, it's such a great moment. They met when he was an artilleryman in Italy. And his artillery brigade was on top of a cliff firing. And there was a beach below with a bunch of tents. And someone had 
not properly secured the howitzer, it fired and toppled off the cliff. And they all went running down and it had flattened some poor guy's tent. And they all run up to the, the tent and they're like, oh my God, we killed some poor guy. And Harry Seacum crawls out from the tent, brushes himself off and says, I say, has anyone seen my cannon? I seem to have mislaid a bloody great cannon somewhere. Just like looking around with behind him, there's this, you know, smoking howitzer thing. And it's that <laughs> sense of humor to me that wow. is just un undefeatable. And uh, has, anyone, has anyone seen my cannon? His uh, son, uh, his son came and stood in for him. I do a radio series over here that's a recreation of a very beloved one called Hancock's Half Hour. And we were recreating some lost episodes that had been wiped. Um, and in some of them, Harry Seacombe stepped in for the main actor, Anthony Hancock. And Fun. so when we recreated them, Harry Seacombe's own son stepped in and he had the same voice. And it was that's doing amazing. Awesome. It was such a thrill, that connection. <gasps> that is absolutely amazing. And, the, you know, and the goons themselves, they are legendary here, you know. I, sh I should send you a copy. I did a comic series called The Princess and the Pinup as part of my Betty Page series. And it's, uh, I had Betty essentially become a government agent investigating UFOs, which is particularly ridiculous. But um, she comes to England because Queen Elizabeth has been kidnapped out of, Notting out of uh, Windsor by a UFO late one night. And MI6 doesn't know how to deal with it. So they call in the UFO specialist who is Betty Page and her and her boss. Yeah. But uh, there's a scene where she and Queen Elizabeth are sneaking out of a, turns out there's a traitor in the government that set the whole thing up. They're sneaking out of a uh, uh, prison facility and there are four British soldiers standing around talking. And it's 90, October, 1953. She hasn't been uh, crowned yet. And I needed something for these guys to just be talking about. And I'm, well, I'll make the talk about the Goon Show. And I looked up, the Goon Show was off the air in eight, October of 1953. But the Goon Show movie in which they play soldiers was in theaters. So as Elizabeth and Betty Page are sneaking by on tiptoes in the background, there are these four guys standing around talking about the Goon Show movie. And one of them is a tall, very goofy, Spike Milligan looking guy who's saying, and then Eccles says, and one of the other guys says, you don't have to look like Eccles. And he says, I'll do not take that back. And they get into an argument and it's just a whole little, little bit of British comedy history. Aww. Aww, little microcosm. Yeah. That's lovely. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah I, I, I I, uh, you know, uh, Douglas Adams doesn't need his, need evangelizing quite as much as Spike Milligan does because it's, Americans are mostly not familiar with The Goon Show. Spike and never had that big, and I forget how many movies he was in just as an actor. So I was flipping channels, yeah. uh, The Three Musketeers was on and there was Spike playing Raquel Welch's <laughs> cuckolded <laughs> husband. <laughs> he, he is possibly the funniest, I think I'm, I'm not misremembering this, the funniest bit in Life of Brian, the Monty Python Life of Brian. I think it is right. it is such a great little cameo. It, it's so funny. I, I think he just happened to be on holiday there at the time, and they went, "This is amazing," and and, and dragged him in. Yeah. And yeah, look out for him. He's the he's the mad old guy. I, like that, I, I can't remember what scene. Like, I can't remember what scene he does because I haven't. The seen shoe is the shoe, and he's he's there, and he. Oh yes, like, yes. That's and such he's a, left alone and everybody leaves him and he's just there and then he yeah. just does this great, this great deadpan walk off yeah. and uh, it's just, it's just funny bone, amazing. Uh, yeah. Oh, so many. And American shows, he did pop up in American films. Is he in um, Funny Thing Happened? Or no, I'm probably thinking of Buster Keaton there. He might be, now he might be in that because that's Richard Lester again. So that makes it right. doubly possible that he would end up in it. But yeah, Spike Milligan and read your read your douglas adams uh you yeah. can probably find the radio shows online the british tv show is great the the one thing i remember about the tv show that cracked me up because 
ninety percent of the jokes are ported over from the radio show in the books. There's not a lot of new material in the TV show. Yeah. But the one, there's one thing, when the book is talking about uh, the Magrathians and their planet making factory, they show a diagram of the planet, of a constructed planet. And it's all very basic stuff while the book is talking. And it's inner molten core, outer molten core, inner crust, outer crust, planet surface, lower atmosphere, toposphere, ionosphere, meringue, optional. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just something that you have to be watching the computer screen during the show. But the idea that the Magrathians are, will, if you pay a little extra, will cover your entire planet yes, in, yes, in, in meringue. Oh, that's uh, nice. Such a good joke. And on the smallness <laughs> of, the smallness of the world and the actors, I've always loved the guy who does Slaughter Bartfast in the yeah. TV series, and I think on the radio show. Can't remember Jay the name of the actor. It's, it's, it's the no, great, uh, I never know how to pronounce his last name, Naji, in the feature film. Tall, skinny, Yvonne, not, not in, that's the criminal. Uh, played the father in Shaun of the Dead, like. No. Oh. But anyway, the guy in the TV show, is the uh, is the representative of the Bank of London who gives Bond his briefing on Goldfinger in Goldfinger? Really, it's just one of those little like he had a great face, he had a great voice, he had hey, that. What, what, the the uh, Zayfor Beeblebrocks. Not Zayfor Beeblebrocks. Um, Slarted Bartfast is the name oh, of the character. Oh, oh. Oh yeah, no, big uh, British character actor. And of course I can't remember what his name is. I can sort of look him up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, oh, uh, and so many, and so many 60s British movies as well. Where is he? Where's Slutty Bart Fast? Richard Vernon. Richard yeah. Vernon, that's right. That's right, yeah. He's just such, a, such an iconic, and I always love, that's one of the great things about watching, you know, old Doctor Who episodes is like, you know, someone will walk in and it's Patrick Stewart and he has four lines and he walks out and you're like, wait, what? You know, uh, yeah. seeing- ben, ben Kingsley pops up in Coronation Street, which is- Right. Very Northern working class days of our lives, you know? And, <laughs> and by the way, that's probably my favorite line in the entire rebooted Doctor Who because it, it deals with the Britishness of Doctor Who when he's, when, when Rose, when he tells Rose Tyler he's from another planet, and she says, "But you sound like you're from the north," and he says, "Lots of planets have a north." <laughs> you know, there's a there's a Yorkshire on on Gallifrey, I guess, and he's from Gallifrey in Yorkshire. Uh, yeah. I just think that's they didn't change his accent at all, and I'm really pleased they didn't. Yeah, I don't know. I I loved Tennant, but I don't know why he couldn't have been Scottish. I love that voice and I love that accent. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I would it would have been fun. Maybe they thought to come straight off Northerner. Yeah, yeah, but we He's, all he know was a great, great Doctor Who. Nor yeah. no, Britons who are not English make the best Doctor Who's and the best uh, and the best James Bonds. It's a well-known <laughs> Scots, Irish, Welsh. Yeah. You know, yeah. like you know, it's a uh, you know one of the <laughs> one of the funniest Hollywood. I was working with a, uh, and then I'll I have to let you go. But I was working on a low-budget movie, and the costume designer was from Yorkshire, and she was a beautiful petite blonde, but she had a thick Yorkshire accent and she was gorgeous and she was trying on she was helping some guy try on a costume and he was hitting on her and he said where are you from you have such a classy accent and we bust out the two of us just laughed in his face and I felt oh. bad about it but she was he was like what's so funny I was like dude she's a hillbilly like you know she's a beautiful girl but that is not that is not a classy British accent. <laughs> that is, you know. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, it's it's gorgeous. I'm just saying, and so are Southern accents in America, but you don't mistake them for something. I know. I mean, I think it's great. You can go over to America and basically right. <laughs> be pretty, 
right. have your own accent. I mean, it's not as they can understand it. I mean, I know Scots people who find it really hard to get understood. Glaswegians, if they've got a very thick accent. Yes. Um, Americans I never. I was, uh, I was in a bar in LA once and I was introduced to some guys who said we're from Scotland. And I said, Glasgow, and they're like, how'd you do it? And I was like, because I can barely understand what you're saying. <laughs> if you were from Edinburgh, I'd kind of probably be- Edinburgh's slightly better spoken. Yeah. I'd probably, you know, especially growing up with Connery and the Bond movies, I'm a little more familiar with that accent. Um, but, uh, but, and also it's that classic thing of the people that are going to leave Scotland and get on a plane are probably not from the high, the people from cities are the ones who do the traveling generally outside of the country. So I was like, I had a 50, 50 between Edinburgh and Glasgow and you definitely are not from Edinburgh. So. It still amazes me how the British Isles have so many very weird accents. I mean, the Birmingham accent versus the Newcastle accent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where they, and then the Scouse Liverpool accent. Right. Different vowel sounds yeah. and different uh, consonants. Well, I mean, honestly, it's like when someone says New York accent, I'm like, Wait, there are a hundred New York accents. Like, right. do you mean my father was from the Bronx and my mother was from Brooklyn and had very different accents? And I always used to joke that I'm Bugs Bunny because that's, uh, I was watching an interview with uh, Mel Blanc once and they said, where'd you come up with that voice? And he said, I took the two most obnoxious accents in America, <laughs> the Brooklyn accent and the Bronx accent, and I combined them. And when I was a kid, my speaking voice was Bugs Bunny. I have in my- Now that you're saying can Bugs Bunny. hear it? I yeah. Like one of my, one of, while we're off on the tangent about accents, one of my favorite things about, uh, I hate it when British actors do an American accent and they like, it's that, and it's that John Cleese, I've got to tell ya, fella, you know, that, that basic mid, who knows where anyone talks like that. You, Laurie, when he did, and I don't know how intentional this was, when he did House, yeah. he's doing my accent. Cause that show, takes, that show takes place in Princeton, New Jersey, and he is doing an educated, New Jersey accent. And there's a thing that I call my New Jersey speech yeah. impediment. And it's no matter how sincere you're being, you sound a little sarcastic. <laughs> you're saying the most sincere thing in the world, but the New Jersey twang makes it a little, do you, do you mean that though? Or are you just, but yeah, my speaking voice when I was 12 was, uh, hey guys, let's go down to Vinny's and get a slice. <laughs> 99 cents for a slice and a Coke. And this is so embarrassing to admit, but I, I will admit it before we go, which is I actually intentionally lowered my voice and my template for an American masculine lowered voice is Harrison Ford. There were worse people I have been, you could I have, been, I have been doing, like literally when I was a teen, because. Raiders comes out when I'm maybe 16 and in the process of, you know, what kind of adult am I going to be? And literally it goes down, it goes to, it's just a worthless bronze medallion, Marion. You're going to give it to me. Like, you know, you just, <laughs> I'm going to blow up the arc, Renee, you know, just a little. <laughs> well, little... you're in good company because Margaret Thatcher also lowered her voice. So there you... Margaret Thatcher also imitating Harrison Ford, I think. Very probably now that I think about it. Yeah. Not convincingly, sadly, but uh, but yeah, but I did love Gillian Anderson. I will say that. I, yeah, she was great. She was great. I, I enjoyed that. You, that's one of those things where you go, how could that possibly work? That gorgeous, delicate sex bomb, and you're going to turn her into there's a lot of that. <laughs> the most sexless <laughs> thing that has ever walked the earth. Um, and yet, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were all great. That what a series. Yeah, uh, it's. It is, and it, it came along at a very lucky time. I was writing that Betty Page in England in 1953 thing, just when the first season, first couple of seasons had come out. And my artist was not English. My artist is, uh, I think in Brazil somewhere. 
And instead of having to bury him in references, I was like, just watch The Crown because that's all the sets, that's all the costumes, that's all the people. What's funny yeah, to me- It's stiff upper lip on steroids, you know, yeah. it is- Well, there's, there's a joke that I tell about Downton Abbey and I think the same thing applies to a lot of The Crown, which as I love both of those shows, but often the dramatic tension of an hour of television really boils down to, I say, old man, you've used the wrong fork. You know, like the stakes are very, not a spoiler for the Downton Abbey movie, but if you see that movie, they foil an attempt on the life of the king and the drama of the assassination attempt is secondary to will the butler be allowed to serve dinner? <laughs> like that's not the climax of the movie isn't they jump a guy with a revolver he's pointing at the king's head the climax of the movie is oh they let the butler serve dinner very, yeah, that's very British you should listen to the archers which is our radio soap opera oh sure the, the 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 cliffhangers are often is the table leg about to fall off right right. right that's what I mean about that show it's like I, I Downton Abbey to me has a little bit not as much the crown, but Downton Abbey to me is a little bit like Gone with the Wind over here, where it's like, I'm not a hundred percent sure you're sad this horrible, stilted way of life is gone. I, <laughs> I'm not sure you're on the side of the oppressed people a hundred percent here, dude. You know, you like this stuff, a, you're a little too in love with the, oh, the yeah. right fork. Of course, yeah. Well, because, he, because he's friends with people who own <laughs> Stem Manor houses. Exactly, and it's there. There, there's. Uh, I mean, again, he did. The, there are nods towards. It's very much the British version, in some ways, of Mad Men. But I think Mad Men is much clearer on. Oh, this was all terrible. <laughs> you know, this was a oh, terrible yeah, yeah. way to live. Everyone yeah. is going to die. If the, all these people die of cancer ten years from now, by the way, you know, like it's, it's bad for all. <laughs> Ah! Anyway, on that cheery note, uh, it has been so lovely chatting with you. I've missed you terribly. I love it to catch I, up. Uh, it's lovely. Are, do you have any plans to travel back to the United States? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, no, very soon, hopefully. We're, we're keeping an eye on things and how they pan out, getting our jabs. Um, but yeah, we'll be back. So we'll... I get my second jab in two days, and I'm oh, congratulations. And excited about it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Get your paracetamol in. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> again, thank you so much for coming on and for reading some Douglas Ab Adams and talking about the British of the history of British comedy with me. In its entirety. I think we covered it all. We did. We, we, we hit everything. <laughs>